Thank you for joining online. My name is Maggie and I'm a volunteer here at Set Free. We want to know what special and exciting things God is doing in your life. So if there's anything that we can do to serve you, be in prayer about, or celebrate with you, please email us at hello at setfreecf.com or give us a call at 864-269-3620. It is because of your generosity that we are able to expand our reach to the kingdom. So if you are blessed by our ministry and would like to donate to our ministry, please visit setfreecf.com slash give. Thanks again for joining us today. We pray that you are blessed by this message. Look at your neighbor and say, who among us? Who among us? Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 14. Oh, Jesus, guys, there it is. I cursed that computer today. <laughs> Things been giving me trouble the last few weeks. Watch this. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness have surprised the hypocrites. A searing question. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? And who among us shall dwell with with everlasting burnings. Who among us will dwell in everlasting burnings? Isaiah said of sinners, he said that they will experience an experience where their worm dieth not, neither shall their fire be quenched. Revelation chapter 14, verses 4 through 10, speaking of sinners, speaking of those who take the mark of the beast, speaking of anybody who has missed God, says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of of the Lamb. Oh God, some of you thinking, I didn't come to church to hear this. I don't want to hear this kind of preaching. Well, you better get up and run out now. Because I'm going to preach this this morning because nobody else is preaching it. This past week, we had Pastor Ray's mother's funeral. Some of y'all, most all of you know Pastor Ray. He was my associate here for 19 years. He retired in February, and his mother passed last week. We had her funeral uh, Wednesday. And um, at the end of the funeral, Don and I were walking back to the car across the graveyard, and this big graveyard. And I'm a kind of a morbid person, I guess, but you walk across the graveyard, and you think it's pretty green grass. When I'm walking across the graveyard, I'm thinking about it, I'm stepping on dead people. And I understand that a graveyard is a place full of dead bodies with souls and spirits that are in eternity somewhere. And I was walking across the graveyard, and I thought, wow, this is a big graveyard. There's a lot of people here. And I heard the Spirit of God say to me, yeah, and most of them's in hell. And it shook me. And I thought, Lord Jesus, how have we gotten to the place that we're at in the church? See, it's, it's not just that we live and we die and we go to the grave and it's over. But the Bible says that it's appointed unto man once to die. And after death, the judgment. I don't expect none of y'all be shouting amen today. I expect you to be searching your heart. Why would you preach something like this? Because if there's anybody in here that's not right with God, I want you to get saved. And then for all of you that are right with God, I want you to get back up under a burden for your family and your neighbors that are not saved. Because we've lost the burden for souls. We have lost the burden for souls. Or I wouldn't be preaching. I'm not fussing at you. I'm just stating fact. I wouldn't be preaching to the same faces every week. We'd have people that were trying to get saved coming in here. We've lost the burden for souls. So there's a place that's called eternity. The Hebrew definition of the word eternity is without end. 
everlasting forevermore. Today, if you can listen close, you can hear the thundering sounds of the Niagara Falls just up ahead. And this whole world is floating downstream in a straw basket about to drop off the precipice. Death is a strong predator. It's the strongest predator on the face of the earth. He relentlessly tracks down each victim, catches up with them, wrestles with them until eventually he drags them down into the grave, and then there's judgment. Death has no prejudice. Death takes them young. Death takes them old. Death takes children. Death takes men. Death takes women. Death takes them white, black, brown, yellow, and red. Death doesn't care. Death pulls everybody into its grips. It's the scenario of a mouse stuck in the tank with a snake. The end is coming. You can wrestle, you can hide, but it's inevitable. It will happen. The snake will eat the mouse. And you will face eternity. Try to put it out your mind all you want to. But you will face eternity. Try not to think about your life and where you're at with God all that you want to. But you will give an account of every idle thought that you had in this world. It's a sad fact. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 14 says, Jesus said, Enter at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many, you could underline many in your Bible, many there be which go in thereat. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Many go in at the broad gate. Only a few people go in at the straight gate. I know this isn't winning friends and influencing people. But I'm going to tell you this morning, based on what Jesus said, the majority of everybody you will see tomorrow will go to hell. I think that it's a Bible principle that three out of four miss God and go to hell. Why do you say that? Because the sower went forth to sow seed, and he sowed four types of seed. Three types of seed were no good. Only one type of seed brought forth fruit. There were 500 in the upper room when Jesus ascended. But by the time the Holy Ghost came, there was 120 Three out of four had missed God. It's my concern that we live in a world where three out of four people worldwide will miss God. And we look at their souls every day, and we don't even have a burden for them. We're too concerned with our blessings, our family. Lord, give me this. When three out of four I think, at least Jesus said many go to hell and few go to heaven. They just miss it. They just miss it. Have you just been around people that you think, if I could just open you up and pour in you the goodness of God, but somehow they have a blank, sin, stupid stare on their face. And most of them think they're saved. All of America is saved if you ask them. Somebody said, and I've heard it been said, well, hell's not so bad. All my friends are going to be there anyway. It'll just be one big party. Stephen Tyler recently, Stephen Tyler is the lead singer for the old rock band Aerosmith. And Stephen Tyler was at a party, a birthday party, for um, Willie Nelson. Everybody knows who Willie Nelson is. And they were toasting Willie Nelson, and Stephen Tyler got up to toast Willie Nelson. He said, Willie, may we have as much fun in hell as we've had on this earth trying to get to hell. 
And the whole place laughed and thought it was funny. But I come by to tell you today, there's nothing funny about if you miss God and you go to hell. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 8 says this. And they shall be afraid. Pains and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. King James says their faces shall be as flames. The original text says they will all be faces in the flames. Faces in the flames. Think about that. Faces in the flames. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 42. If you miss God, it says, and, and, and the angel shall cast them into a furnace of fire. And there shall be welling and gnashing of teeth. Matthew in another place says that hell is a place where there's everlasting fire. He said again that hell is a place of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. How could God prepare a hell for man to go to? He didn't. He prepared it for the devil. But if you're going to serve him, if you're going to live for him, you're going to get to go with him. Who among us? I want that to drop into your spirit today. Who among us should dwell? Among everlasting burnings. I have had people who were members of this church who of their own admission turned on God and died in terrible sin. The last time I preached this, I don't like to preach this way about every year or two, but a a year or so back, the last time I preached something like this, there was a young man here. It was the only time in his life he'd ever been in church. The only time he was with some f- a family, he'd been raised by a wicked family. It was the only time in his life he'd ever been in church. And he sat right here. And I preached similar to this. And I gave the altar call. And he shook with conviction. His face turned. He's a white boy, but he got whiter than white. And conviction was on him. And he never came down. And I begged and I pleaded and I tried to work the Spirit and I tried to get him to come down. And he never come down. He's just a young man. I don't know what he was thinking. Maybe I got my whole life ahead of me. This was the first time he'd been in church in his life. That following week, he had an accident and went off into unconsciousness and never regained consciousness. Never could they get any response out of him. And he slipped off into eternity. They never had a witness of him except in Jesus. But the whole family knew that he sat and resisted the Holy Ghost the week before his accident. It's a frightening thought, church. Who among us could dwell among everlasting flames? We need to check ourselves. We need to get a burden back for people that are around us that are going to hell. Well, who do you say somebody's going to hell? I'm just telling you what Jesus said. He said, many will. I'm not judging anybody. I'm not anybody's judge. But I can tell you this. Once you arrive in eternity, if you're not right with God, the games that you played in front of people are over with in eternity. The excuses that you've made become real empty. I don't go to church. I don't serve God because this preacher did that or somebody hurt me or that offense happened or this offense happened or I don't like how they do this. I don't Listen, once you get into eternity, all of that reasoning that you put between you and Jesus means nothing. The reality of the present truth has manifested. What is that? You have died unsaved your religion was empty and void you did not have a born again experience with God now there be no denying 
You can't push it off to later once you get in eternity. Most everybody will tell you that they're going to get, everybody wants to go to heaven. Everybody going to get saved one day. Nobody just stand up and say, I'm going to die and miss, I'm going to die serving the devil. No, everybody in their mind thinks that eventually they'll get it right. 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 But when you get to that place, there's no putting it off to later. It's done. There are no second chances. Just a sobering sense of the reality that you find yourself is, and that is the present horrors that you are now living in. You will say to yourself, God did all He could do, and I still refused Him, and now I'm in hell. You think about what a sacrifice that Jesus hung on a cross, was beat, and shed His blood. And it was so easy for me. All I had to do was just ask Him to forgive me and quit my sinning. But I loved my sin more than I did what Jesus did for me. What will your first day in eternity be like? What will it be like to step through the veil and be unsaved? To have been in church and played around on God and left sin in your life that you knew the Holy Ghost over and over told you, you need to deal with this, you need to deal with this, but you covered it up, you knew how to, you knew how to act religious, you knew how to flow in whatever your place of ministry or your family was or however people looked at you, you knew how to cover it and you never dealt with it. I'm going to read a, a few verses of Scripture, and then I'm going to come back and take them apart. But I want you to understand before you go home here today, if you miss God, what it'll be like. I don't like to preach this way, but you see, the Bible says that for a minister, if I don't warn you, then your blood is on my hands. And I don't want to stand before God one day at a judgment, and you cast into hell, and, and look down, and God say, their blood's on your hands, Steve. All you'd had it done was told him. Put up the scriptures for me. We'll read through the whole thing, Brett. There was a certain man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuous every day. Oh, wait a minute, Brother Steve. This is a parable. This is a story. No, it says there was a certain man. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. Thank God angels escort Christians in the eternity. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell. He lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. And cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Just drop a drop of water. Just let me, just off the end of his finger onto my tongue. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things. Likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted. And thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass from there to us. You got ahead of me. Verse 27, Then said he, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. He's thinking about his brothers. I have five brethren, that they may testify unto them, lest they also come unto this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went... To them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither would they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. If they won't read their Bible, let me say that again. If they just won't listen to the Word of God, (laughs) then nothing else is going to get them. If they won't listen to the Word of God, then there's no hope for them to be saved any other way. I want you to talk to you about what we just read in that, in that story. 
what your first day in eternity will be like if you're lost. In verse 23, hold it up there a moment, it says, And he being in torments. I want to talk to you about that. The word being in the Greek means a continuance, a continuing existence. This is something that doesn't end when it starts. And torments is a, is a very wicked word. He being in torments, listen to what the Greek for torments there is. Tortured by someone else. Repeated torture sessions. And he experiencing repeated torture sessions. Tortured by someone else. I believe that the Bible is clear that the demons of God will wreak havoc on you over and over and over. One man claims he had a near-death experience. Said that he saw hell. He was unsaved and he saw hell. He said that he saw a man that had murdered his wife and this man had choked his wife to death when he murdered her. He said that this man walked back and forth rubbing his hands. Rubbing his hands. He was completely out of control in fear. And that ever so often some demons would show up. And just like he choked his de- wife, they would choke him to death, grab him by the neck and choke him till he would fall down. And then they'd leave and he'd stand up and he'd wait for him to come back to choke him again. He said, I'm in these torments. I'm in repeated torture sessions. He said he saw another man that had burned some people alive. He said he saw another man that occasionally demons would show up and take something like a razor and cut him and completely strip his skin off of him all the way down to where he was raw. Then they would leave and he'd be back normal. Then they'd come back and completely he'd get to experience it all over again. What is the worst possible scenario that you, are you, you're afraid of spiders? Maybe suddenly you're covered with thousands of spiders. What's the worst possible scenario? Whatever it is. He said, I'm in these torments. It's repeated. It's over. It's over. It's over. I hate to think of a man who goes to hell who abused a child or raped a woman. I don't know what, what that was. I hate to think of murderers over and over and over and over. I'm, I'm being in torments. I'm being in torments. The Greek is there's a continuing existence of these repeated torture sessions. There's a continued existence of these repeated torture sessions. And you walk to and fro, and you rub your hands. Then in verse 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented. Can I tell you something? 2,000 years ago, Derek, that man cried for a drip of water. Today, 2,000 years later, he's still crying for a drip of water. 2,000 years from today, he'll still be crying for a drip of water. 10,000 years from today, he'll still be crying, feeling the torment, feeling that sensation of, I'm parched. I'm so thirsty. I need something to drink. What that tells me is that if we go to hell, every physical sensation that we have now, we will still have. There's no rest. There's no relief. If you go to hell and you're a drug addict forever, You'll be craving for those drugs. The alcoholic who dies and goes to hell 
forever. His body is screaming, I gotta have a drink, I gotta have a drink, I gotta have a drink. I'm not saying that tobacco will send you to hell, make you stink like hell, but it might not send you to hell. But if you die and go to hell and you've got an addiction to nicotine forever, you will crave a cigarette. Crave it. Would that not be part of hell? Cravings that you can't fulfill. Just constantly gnawing at you. Gnawing at you. Gnawing at you. Verse 25, he says this. And Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received your good. Likewise, Lazarus, evil. Here's what I want you to see. Son, remember your lifetime. As you're there in a lake, You can't even find something solid to stand on. You're just there. There's no place to rest your head. There's no chair to set your trembling body down and and take a moment of reprieve from this continued suffering. But he said, remember your lifetime. At the same time that this is going on, you're going to be so homesick There will be such a yearning in your spirit. I wished I could see home. I just wished I could go home. You'll be consumed with the thought, I wished I could hold my baby. If I could just hug my children one more time. I'm I'm, I'm in this forever torment. I can find no rest. I'm out of control in a lake. But, oh, I can remember my family. Oh, God, what I wouldn't do to look my son in the eyes. You'll say, if I could just talk to somebody that I knew loved me. If just somebody would look at me with a look of love. If I could go back, I just want to go home. That'll be your cry. I just want to go home. If I could go back, I'd do it different. If I could go back, I would pray. If I could go back, I would read my Bible. If I could go back, I would go to church. If I could go back, I'd tell all my loved ones. But the truth of the matter is, you'll never see your loved ones again. What you'll see is millions of multiplied millions of hands and faces in the flames. And you'll hear the screams, the weeping, the torment, the begging, the song of suffering souls. But there's no reprieve and there's no second time. And you think you're too cool to serve Jesus now. All your coolness will be gone when you get to hell. Verse 26, he said, And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come here. Paradise was then still in the center of the earth. He was saying, once you get in hell, you can't leave. Let me tell you something. Even though paradise has been moved out of the center of the earth, it's the same thing. Once you wind up in hell, you can't leave. It's final. You can't appeal, God. You can't go to a Supreme Court and appeal it. You can't ask for a second trial. You just never, never, forevermore, everlasting, you just regret that you let some little silly something Some little piece of flesh. Some little stubborn spirit. Just straight up, some people go to hell just over being too lazy to serve God. I was talking with a man here a while back, a couple months ago, who attended this church, was a big part of this church. 
And I said, listen, you need to get your family and get in church. He, his wife, none of the kids, none of them are in church. I said, you know that you need to be serving God and get in church. And Regina, you know what he said to me? I know all that, but it just feels so good to relax on Sunday mornings. I would hate to go to hell and not serve God. Because this man knows if he comes to church, he's going to get fired up for God. But it just feels so good to sleep in. He said, I love to drink my coffee and watch the news programs. I'd rather drink my coffee and come hear the gospel preached and get in the Holy Ghost. But whatever it is, once you arrive at that designation, there's a frightening finality. It's over with. And then, here's what's even worse. You, Lord, remember my life. Remember your life. Lord, I, I, I want to see my children. I want to see my family. I want to go home. And then in verse 26, or verse 28, rather, he says, here's what the man said, I have five brethren. Send somebody that he may testify unto them, lest they also come unto this place of torment. I, I got... F- I got five brothers. He may have been the oldest. He was rich. He may have been the most influential. And now he's starting to think, oh my God, how did I influence them? You know, I think the only thing worse than going to hell is if you take somebody else with you. Yes, sir. Is if you know you've influenced somebody and caused them to go to hell too. My brother was to die in a terrible accident just a few weeks after his 18th birthday. And on his 18th birthday, I walked into a, a store with him and made a joke out of it. You're 18, now you buy your own beer. And when he died, I started thinking about how have I influenced him? Because he died drunk in a car wreck. How have I influenced him? I don't know his eternity. My family and I want to believe God that he called out. But I want to tell you something that bothers me. And if I was in hell, and I knew that the example I left was saying that you will be worried sick about your family if you go to hell and you didn't tell them. I would hate to be a daddy that dies and goes to hell and looks back and says, I didn't raise my kids in church. I didn't tell them that they need to serve God. As a matter of fact, I said in the example they should serve money. And serve their flesh. And I wish to God at all the holidays and all the family gatherings, I hadn't have been drunk in front of them. I wish they had heard me pray. I wish they had seen me read my Bible. I sure wish they hadn't heard me cuss. Abraham, I got five brothers. Here's where I want us to be today. You might not be so upset over your family today. But once eternity rolls around, you will be. I wish to God we could get a burden for our family today. I wish we could be completely torn up over the fact that some of them are on their way to hell today. And that we would beg with them, plead with them, pray for them, and do whatever we can to get saved today. And then verse 29. And Abraham, he said, send somebody to my brothers. And Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophet. Let them hear them. Now here's what I think will be an excruciating torment to a person who played church, played around on God, and then missed Him. This brother remembered Moses and the prophets, which meant he knew the Old Testament. Tanya, if we go to hell, we will remember over and over and over every Bible verse that we've ever read. Your mind will rehearse like a movie theater 
every sermon that you ever heard preached. But by the time the first thousand years is over, going toward the first billion, million, you'll be able to preach every sermon yourself better than the man that preached them when you heard them. Over and over and over. They've got Moses. They've got the prophets. Those scriptures will scream at you. All I had to do was believe in my heart. All I had to do was believe Jesus died for me. All I had to do was confess Him as Lord. All I had to do was repent for my sin. You start talking to yourself, He didn't even ask me to be perfect. Like as a father that pitieth his children, he knew my frame, he knew I was frail. He was not even demanding perfection out of me. He just wanted me to try. And I didn't even try. I want to read you something. I got some stats here. My whole reason for preaching this sermon is... I want us to begin to see soul save church. I love each one of y'all. There's nothing that I wouldn't do for any one of y'all. You are dear to my wife and I's heart. When somebody leaves this church, it crushes us like we had a death in the family. But let me tell you something. Please don't misunderstand me. As much as I love you, I'm sick to death of preaching to the same faces every Sunday. I need to see soul saved. I need to see families brought in and excited about the things of God. Listen to these statistics. I thought, how many people actually die every day? And we act like we're not concerned. I want you to listen to this. I'm going to break this down where maybe God will put an urgency in you. 55.3 million people on this earth, die every day. 55.3 million die. I mean, every year. Excuse me, every year. 55.3 million die every year. 100, 151,600 souls die per day. Let me let, let that number sink in. 151 thousand six hundred souls die per day. What if three fourths of them went to hell? That equates to this six thousand three hundred and sixteen people. Six thousand three hundred and sixteen people die per hour. By the time we get out of here in a few minutes, over twelve thousand people have died since we started church. If three-fourths of them go to hell, by the time we get out of here in a few minutes, in the last two hours while you have been here, over 8,000 people have split hell wide open. I said, while you have been here, deciding whether or not you like this church, whether or not you feel like you want to worship, I don't know if I like that song, I don't know if this is too loud, I don't know if they're doing a Sunday school ride or tea. While you've been, you know, man be a be butt sitting in a chair, while you've been here doing that, 8,000 people dropped off into hell. I should smile when I say that, shouldn't I? But I want you to understand the seriousness of this. I thought about this. Easily, the city of Easley has twenty in the year twenty sixteen had twenty thousand nine hundred and fifty three people in it. That was the population for the city of Easley. Twenty thousand nine hundred and fifty three, twenty one thousand people in the city of Easley. A hundred and fifty one thousand die per day. Listen, over seven times the population of the whole city of Easley. All them people in the evening. God knows if you go through there, it's crowded around 5 o'clock and in the morning. All them people, seven times that many people die every day. And we're happy to stay in our sin, play church, and if we get one or two people a year saved, we think we've done something. 
when seven times the whole population of this community dies every day. When 8,000 plus went to hell today while you've been in church. And they're in torments. And they're remembering their lifetime. And they're worried sick about their families. And it's final. Everybody glad you came to church today? Don't you think that it's time we wake up? Don't you think that maybe it's time that the house of God and serving God isn't a second thought, an afterthought, you do this if you don't have something else going on, but don't you think that it's time we make the house of God and serving God our number one priority again? But here's the good news. Throw up the uh, scripture in Peter, that former second Peter. Here's the good news. Uh oh. That's the wrong scripture. I, did I give you the wrong scripture? Let me quote it for you. Here's the good news God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What all I've just said God's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Mark, help me. Your Bible still says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but should have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Let me tell you, I'm not the smartest man in the world. But I'm smart enough to figure this out. Here's how smart I am. I'm not stupid enough to go to hell. Amen. I know one thing. That... Man's promised three score and ten, seventy. Some people believe for 120. I'm believing for that too. But I know that it's nothing compared to eternity. I know the Bible says that at one time God winked at people's sins. But Betty, now He demands that people repent. And I know this. I know it's a sorry example that the church has set today. We've got more drunks and adulterers leading churches than preaching a socially accepted gospel. And seven times the city of Easley drops off into hell every day. We can't save the whole world. But we can get serious about our little circle of influence. And we can go back and say, Lord, give me a burden to see people saved. Give me a burden to see people say, every head's bowed, every eye's closed. First, if you're here and you say, Preacher, boy, you rung my bell today. If I died today, if I left here and died before I got home, I'd go to hell. I'm not, I'm not really really where I should be. Oh, I can fake y'all out. I can fake people out. But I know in my heart that I'm not really where I should be. And I just want to raise my hand where I sit and say, I don't want to go to hell. I want you to pray with me. I want you to pray with me. I want you to pray with me. I see that hand. I see that hand. Is there any more hands? I see that hand. Anybody else? You... You say, oh my God, i got to know, i got to know. Oh, are you wrestling in your mind? Well, well, I'll have to give up this. I'll have to stop that. I'll have to change this. Be the best thing you've ever done. It ain't worth going to hell over anyway. I said, it ain't worth going to hell over anyway. I see those hands. What you're saying is, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, to, I'm going to do my best to serve God. I'm not, 
I'm, I'm not perfect. I don't think I'll be perfect at, ver- at first, but I'm going to take a step and I'm going to go toward God and I'm going to begin to grow and I'm going to begin to try to do what I need to do. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand back there. Anybody else? The Spirit of God's dealing with you right now. And you say, oh my God, I, I, I cannot take a chance on this. Listen, I can drive down this afternoon. Bob, I can drive down just below my house to my brother's grave. And I stand there and I don't know. I have a hope. I'm sure my mother's cried a many tears. And we pray and we ask and we beg God that He got saved. But we don't know. Please don't die and us not know about you. Please don't go into eternity and us not know. Oh, you'll know. But us not know. Everybody raise your hand. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Just stand to your feet. I'm not going to ask you to come down. I just want you to stand where you're at. We're going to all pray a prayer together right now. Stand to your feet. You raise your hand. Let's pray. That's great. Come on. That's great. I see everybody standing. I see everybody standing. Everybody pray this prayer with me. There's two, four, six, seven of you standing. There's one or two more of you that raise your hand. You're not standing. You can't be ashamed. <laughs> if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the angels. But if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you before the angels, Jesus said. You can't be ashamed. Anybody else you need to stand up. Let me tell you young people something. Don't you, don't you think i got ten years to play in this mess? And then I'll get saved. You might not have tomorrow. You don't know what you got. I don't care if you're 16, 17 years old. You're not promised next week. My brother was 18 when he went out into eternity. Don't play on God. Don't play on God.